so it starts innocently enough. A young patient has chest pain, or dizziness, or syncope, or shortness of breath. Among your list of dangerous diagnoses, you think, could this young person have a cardiac problem? You order an EKG. You're handed the EKG. Now what? You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horachko. In emergency medicine, we have to own the electrocardiogram, regardless of the age of the patient. In young children, there are quite a few changes in the length of segments or in axis or morphology, but before we get bogged down with all of the technical details that may or may not make much of a difference to the patient in front of us, let's establish our real focus. We're here to detect and manage really what ends up only being a handful of conditions. We're not here to obsess over graphs and charts of normal parameters by age or month of life. We're here to catch the potential killers. This is where patterns save lives. Let's spend a little time ingraining our crania with what these killers look like so that we can pick them out in a lineup. Yes, we have to be systematic. Rate, rhythm, access, but we do this anyway. We're not going to miss a dangerous arrhythmia or an abnormal rate because, let's just say at this point, all of that is given. What we want to focus on now is taking us from a quantitative look to a more qualitative look. We need to be preloaded and sensitized to certain patterns that have clinical consequences. In part one of this two-part series, we'll go over two heavy hitters, WPW and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In part two, we'll talk about all of the orphan children of the EKG, QT abnormalities, Brugada, and ARVD. Are you pumped? Let's get started. <laughs> In utero, it's all about the right heart. In fetal circulation, the left heart gets the summer off. The left heart chills out and it pumps blood into the systemic circuit without much systemic vascular resistance to speak of. Not so for the right heart. The right heart receives blood from the placenta via the inferior vena cava, and it has to fight its way into getting mixed blood into the pulmonary arteries, which have a high resistance since they're just going to countless dense blobs of non-aerated alveoli. In addition, the right heart has another task. It has to generate enough force to push blood also through the flap between the atria, the foramen ovale. For this reason, we're born with predominant right-sided forces on the EKG. Now, this little jaunt down neonatal circulatory memory lane is all to help explain the clinically significant differences that you'll see in the pediatric EKG. Let's start with the simplest. You'll see a right axis deviation. Remember, in the adult EKG, a popular way of determining axis is to look at leads 1, 2, and AVF. Put up your dukes. That's right. Put up your right fist and your left fist. Just make a note of your left leg for now. Careful if you're driving. Or if you're jogging. Or doing housework or whatever you're doing. But both fists up. You're in great shape. A normal axis. The right fist is lead 1 and the left fist is lead 2. If both complexes both fists are up, you have a normal axis, and you're ready to defend yourself against the axis of evil or something pathologic. Okay, another scenario. Both fists are up. And now your right fist deviates down. Uh-oh, 
right axis deviation. Your lead one is down. That is your QRX complex is downward and deflected in lead one. You with me so far? Okay, let's try another scenario. Lead one is your right fist. Lead two is your left fist, like before. Normal axis. Uh-oh, your left fist, lead two, is deviating down. Now you have left axis deviation. If you just have one fist down, the left fist, lead two is down, that may be physiologic in an adult. But if you see the left foot down too, your AVF is deflected down now too. This is a pathologic left axis deviation. It's just too much left axis deviation, man. So to recap, both fists up, both leads one and two are up. That's normal. The right fist down now only. So lead one is down. That's right axis deviation. Left fist down only. So just lead two is down. Left axis deviation. If both your left fist and left foot are deviated down, so lead two and AVF are both down, that is definitely some pathologic left axis deviation. Remember all that stuff about how when we're born, we have a predominantly right-sided forces on our EKG because our right ventricle is just so swole, bro? Okay, what would that look like in a normal child's EKG? Well, your right lead is one, and if that fist deviates down, the QRS deflection is downward, then you've got yourself some right axis deviation. That is okay if you're a neonate or an infant. Right axis deviation is normal and found even in some preschoolers and school-age children. You may not see total deviation, but a tendency for a downward deflection is all totally normal. Okay, in young children, that right ventricle dominance can also yield an RSR prime. That is, after the R wave, we have an S wave, and lo and behold, another R wave, an R prime. That's just the right ventricle showing you how buff it is. What you looking at, bro? V1 is where to find him, the RSR prime. Further down the precordial leads, in V2 and V3, you'll still see a dominant R wave. Since there's so much muscle mass in the right ventricle as a young child, you'll also see normal repolarization changes. That is, the QRS complex is so dominated by the right ventricle that when the septum repolarizes, it shows up on the pediatric EKG as an inverted T wave in the precordial leads. Now, in an adult, with any symptoms whatsoever, we think of this inverted T wave as an abnormal repolarization pattern in the setting of ischemia. This isn't true in children. Inverted T waves in the precordial leads are totally normal. Again, an artifact of a dominant right ventricle, so nothing to see here. These precordial inverted T waves in a pediatric EKG are so normal that they're called juvenile T waves. They can persist, especially in young girls and women, well into their 20s. A five-year-old boy comes to the ED for nausea and vomiting and feeling generally ill. It doesn't help that there seems to be a local epidemic of the exact same symptoms in what feels like every other patient lately. You see a boy who is sitting up, but tired and doesn't appear too well. He's slightly pale. Mom says that's new for him. Symptoms all started this afternoon. When she dropped him off for kindergarten earlier today, he was fine. You listen to his heart too fast. His pulse, thready. You get him on the monitor and you see a wide complex tachycardia at 280 beats per minute. No one has a sinus heart rate of 280. You call for an EKG and in the meantime, you grab a latex glove, dump some ice in there, fill it with water and tie off the glove. 
you place your ice water slurry over his eyes as you wait for the EKG and you ask him to blow through a straw. Or you can also use a 10cc syringe, pull out the plunger to loosen it up and put it back. Have the patient blow into the syringe to make that plunger move up. It's a mega Valsalva. With these maneuvers, the heart rate slows slightly, but right back up as soon as he stops blowing. EKG arrives. It seems like it takes forever to put the leads on, but you now see a better picture of what you saw on the monitor, and it's clear. A wide, complex tachycardia. Is this VTAC? SVT with aberrancy? Well, he is hemodynamically stable, but you place the pads anyway, and you get an IV. You think... This is a young boy. He's never had any issues before. Should I treat it like any other SVT and give adenosine? Or do I try procainamide? And just as you're about to call out your meds, he breaks. He feels tired, but less nauseated now. His heart rate is 120. You see a normal sinus rhythm. That PR is short. The QRS is normal now that he's back in sinus, but you don't like the look of that slurred upstroke of the R wave. You're going to call it. Yep. Young child, sudden onset, wide complex tachycardia. This was not just any supraventricular tachycardia. This was a runaway train of a dysrhythmia. The impulse was propagated through an accessory track. Okay, call it. WPW. Wolf-Parkinson-White Syndrome. You feel a sense of clarity, of mission now. You know what to do. In fact, that decision, that assessment, opened your eyes to another finding with WPW. There is a pseudo-infarction pattern in AVL. From afar, it just looks like a deep Q wave in AVR, a potential sign of infarction in the right patient. But when you look more closely, there is a tiny uptick showing an upward tiny Q, and the deep downward deflection is actually an R wave, the pseudo-infarction sign seen in AVL with WPW. It's really just the mirror image of the slurred upstroke. The main takeaway here is that the delta wave that we look for as a tip-off for that accessory tract, remember, the bundle of Kent, it can be subtle in children. In adults, the pattern tends to be easier to see if it hasn't already been ablated by now. WPW can cause one of three patterns. An orthodromic tachycardia, an antidromic tachycardia, or either with atrial fibrillation. Ortho means correct. Dromos means road or path. So, Orthodromic conduction means that the impulse from the AV node to the ventricles passes through the normal correct conduction system, but instead of ending there in an impulse, the accessory path carries that stimulus further right back into the AV node, in effect, short-circuiting what would otherwise be a resting period. In orthodromic conduction, the signal will go down faster through the normal route and just be fed continuously extra impulses from the runaway accessory track. Remember, the AV node is the worker bee of the conduction system. It takes orders, and it takes them well. If you tell it to send a signal, it will send a signal, no questions asked. So the AV node is vulnerable to an accessory path telling it, Non-stop, keep going. Since the impulse travels through the normal, correct way in orthodromic WPW, you see a narrow complex tachycardia that can look just like any other SVT. Antidromic means, you guessed it, against the normal path. So the impulse here goes faster down the accessory track, where it propagates back up the conduction system towards the AV node, where it quickly finds the accessory track again and keeps the dysrhythmia going up against normal traffic. Since this is against the grain, the impulse doesn't travel in the normal direction. It travels against it. And because of this, the impulse takes longer 
and you'll see a wide complex tachycardia, just like in the case of your five-year-old boy we talked about earlier. WPW with atrial fibrillation probably makes us the most uncomfortable of all of these three. First, it just looks bizarre. If you see a fast, irregular rhythm with bizarre QRS complexes of different morphologies, beware. If that tachycardia is irregular with many different QRS complexes, and those QRS complexes are wide, you've got on your hands WPW with atrial fibrillation. The AFib is showering the accessory path with impulses. If the accessory path can conduct those impulses faster than the AV node can, then you don't just have atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. You have WPW gone wild, irregular, wide complex tachycardia. Because if there really is no regulation with the AV node, atrial fibrillation can eventually become ventricular fibrillation. This is the scariest of the three WPW variations, mostly because what we can do to these patients to try to help them can hurt them. So let's talk treatment. If we have an orthodromic WPW, so narrow complex tachycardia, looking just like any other SVT, you may not get any other history except for the typical SVT story. Sudden onset, plus or minus history of the same that spontaneously resolved. You're likely not going to know whether the child has WPW. So we can't live on eggshells. If you see an SVT in a stable child, treat him like anyone else. While you're getting the adenosine, you can try vagal maneuvers, ice to the face, just like we talked about. Give adenosine fast at 0.1 milligrams per kilogram up to 6 milligrams. You can double it if needed to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram up to 12 milligrams. Make sure that rhythm strip is running. In the unstable narrow complex tachycardia, remember, synchronized cardioversion is always your friend. 1 to 2 joules per kilo. If you happen to know that he has WPW and he presents with a narrow complex tachycardia, which again can look like just any other SVT, and he's stable, of course you can give the treatment of choice for stable WPW, procainamide. Now, as far as dosing for procainamide goes, I'd rather we just look it up. No shame in that. In fact, different references will give you slightly different dosing and that's just fine. But just so that this is familiar, give 15 milligrams per kilogram over 30 minutes and watch for QRS prolongation. You can give up to one gram and you stop the infusion if the QRS complex increases by 50%. Okay, what if you have an antidromic WPW, so a wide complex tachycardia? In an adult, a wide complex tachycardia usually means badness. It is better to assume it's ventricular tachycardia with all of its associated connotations. It turns out in children, 85% of wide complex tachycardias are actually SVT with aberrancy, but I wouldn't get too comfortable with that. Luckily, whether you're no bigger than a bread box or as big as a bread truck, if you have a stable wide complex tachycardia, you can also receive procainamide, and it's the same dosing. Electricity, of course, is never wrong, regardless of age. Synchronized cardioversion at 1 to 2 joules per kilo, up to 200 by phasic to start. For the bizarre, irregular, wide complex tachycardia, that is WPW with atrial fibrillation, we can do the same thing. Procainamide and or synchronized cardioversion. Easy, right? Well, not so fast. The most important thing to say here is that if there is a wide complex tachycardia 
please, please, for the love of everything that is rhythmical, do not give adenosine. Let me say that again. Wide complex tachycardia, you no get adenosine. Why? Am I being too particular or too academic? I think you know me better by now. Giving adenosine to a wide complex tachycardia can be dangerous. Why? Well, recall what adenosine does to the heart. It blocks the AV node. If this is an SVT, narrow complex tachycardia, then awesome. We want the AV node to block all of the supraventricular stimuli to allow the junctional rhythm, the inherent rhythm, to kick in and reestablish itself. Wide complex tachycardias are kind of like parasites. They'll take and take and eat up your resources fast without any concern for the host. And like most parasites, if you leave them be walled off to outside forces, they will devour you. The only hope is to pry open that nasty cyst of circus movement. A normal nodal impulse is the only tool that you have to crack open that deadly dysrhythmia, either by chemical means or by electricity. We need to get a normal impulse to go through that AV node. If you, I don't know, block the AV node, where are you going to get? Nowhere. But now this time, nowhere even faster. If you block the AV node, the rogue impulse will conduct now preferentially through the accessory tract. There's no regulation there. In a stable wide complex tachycardia, at best, it's a waste of time. At worst, you're prolonging the wide complex tachycardia. If you have a wide complex tachycardia caused by WPW with atrial fibrillation, Remember, the atria are showering the accessory pathway with impulses, and the AV node is doing what, it's, what it can to block what it can. If you block the AV node because you're just going to turn your brain off and give adenosine, you're almost guaranteeing that the atrial rate of 300, say, is going to conduct really well into those ventricles. You take atrial fibrillation and you help it along the bypass tract to cause something that I like to call ventricular fibrillation. V-fib is not our friend. Don't block the one guy who can be your buddy, the AV node. So just to be clear, that means any AV blocker, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, even if you want to control what you think is atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, that's safe only for narrow complex tachycardias. Please don't give an AV nodal blocking agent to a wide complex tachycardia. Okay, that got tense. We're still friends, though, right? Thanks. I knew I could count on you. Let's talk hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you're unlucky enough to inherit any one of 150 mutations in your beta myosin heavy chain, instead of having an orderly quilt work of overlapping cardiac myocytes, you may get a cellular disarray resulting in chaotic tissue architecture, causing hypertrophy, obstruction, or dysrhythmias. It runs in families, it's autosomal dominant, but the penetrance is variable, and so are the mutations that can cause it, so it may be tricky to pin down initially. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy affects 1 in 500 people, with an annual mortality of 1 to 2 percent. Dysfunction at the cellular level causes macro problems like thickening of the intraventricular septum, apical hypertrophy, or concentric hypertrophy of the left ventricle. Classically, the anterior intraventricular septum is hypertrophied, causing the mitral valve to be displaced during systole. 
It flops in the way of the blood flow, causing a dynamic left outflow tract obstruction. In addition, the displaced leaky mitral valve catches part of the outflow, like wind in a sail, and you get a retrograde blood flow, mitral valve regurgitation, and a cycle of dysfunction and abnormal adaptation will follow. So, of course, the classical presentation is not the typical presentation. The obstructive variant of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, something that colloquially we call hokum, this only occurs in a smaller subset, in 25% of cases. 75% of the time, there is no obstructive component, but that doesn't mean that you don't get stiff, hypertrophied ventricles that are not so good at forward flow. It also doesn't stop you from generating a dysrhythmia anywhere in this rat's nest of myocytes that you find in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you may see someone classically with exertional syncope or presyncope, probably from the outflow obstruction. But more commonly, you'll just see symptoms of a terribly non-efficient heart, like fatigue, or dyspnea on exertion, or shortness of breath that you can't otherwise explain, or even angina. Thicker myocardial walls need to be nourished, and there may be a supply and demand mismatch. Beware of palpitations. Get that ECG. That may be the only symptom of a dysrhythmia. So speaking of ECG, wait, before we start doing tests, remember, we got to do our exam. So just briefly, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you'll hear the systolic ejection murmur, crescendo, decrescendo. You may get some dynamic changes in the murmur as well. To remember them, let's just try to stay focused on what happens to the left ventricle's volume. When you increase preload, you have more ventricular volume. More is going to fill. Also, you can get increased left ventricular volume by increasing the afterload. More is staying. So when you have an increase in either preload or afterload, you have an increase in left ventricular volume. This stents open the left ventricle and its outflow tract. It balloons open and the blood flows more easily and more quietly, and the murmur decreases. More plainly, if you increase preload or afterload, you stent open the track and the murmur decreases. So if you happen to be squatting and then quickly stand, you release a bolus of blood and you increase your preload. If you do a hand grip, you are increasing afterload. Remember, you're also ballooning open that left ventricle because of the gradient pressure. And that is how hand grip decreases the murmur. Squat to stand and hand grip, they both decrease the murmur in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Just the opposite happens with decreases in preload, like Valsalva. So Valsalva will increase the murmur. Just remember, it takes action to make things better. Squat to stand, hand grip action, it improves the murmur. The murmur decreases. With Valsalva, you're just lying there, so things worsen. The murmur increases. Hand grip or stand from squat, quieter. Valsalva, louder. Okay, now you have your EKG. If there is asymmetric septal hypertrophy, you'll see narrow, deep, dagger-like Q waves in the inferior and lateral leads. If the machine says prior MI in an otherwise healthy young person, be skeptical. And also remember this common mimic of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Lateral dagger-like Q waves are the most common finding. You may also see P mitrale from left atrial hypertrophy. 
left ventricular diastolic dysfunction that we see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it can lead to a compensatory left atrial hypertrophy with signs of left atrial enlargement. So the left ventricle doesn't work so well and the left atrium gets lazy and puffy. Left atrial hypertrophy shows up as P mitrale on the ECG. This is the notched P wave in lead two. Remember, lead two is good for P wave morphology. Right atrial enlargement is a tall P wave, P pulmonale, hypertrophy from back pressures in the pulmonary artery circuit, a sign of right heart strain as well. So as a reminder, P mitrale is a normal amplitude but notched P wave, a sign of left atrial enlargement. P pulmonale is a tall P wave. Pulmonale is tall. Mitrale is nicked, notched. Mitrotched. <laughs> okay, you get the point. Tall P pulmonale, notched P mitrale. Remember still to look for signs of pre-excitation in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There is an association with WPW and HCM. Double that whammy. The most intuitive thing we look for on EKG here is evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. There are umpteen criteria and formulae to use if you had all day, but when the rubber hits the road, in adolescents and adults, we most commonly use either the sokolov leon criteria or the Cornell criteria. The classic sokolov leon criteria are very familiar. It's that thing when you take the depth of the S wave in V1 plus the height of the R wave in V5 or V6. You add them up and they're greater than 35 millimeters. Sometimes you don't quite meet criteria that way. If so, you can use the Cornell criteria. One easy criterion on the list is look for the R in AVL. If it's greater than 11 millimeters, you have yourself some left ventricular hypertrophy. 11 millimeters looks like LL AVL. How tall is your AVL? 11 millimeters LVH. Now, in preteens, I just have to say, we got to look up the actual numerical parameters. But in general, if the S in V1 or the R in V6 is greater than the 98th percentile for age, you can also make the diagnosis of LVH. Just remember that the EKG is by itself not sufficient to rule in or rule out left ventricular hypertrophy. If you're really concerned, you need that echo. Okay, let's say that you got LVH on EKG. You have a good story for it, and the EKG has the criteria. Now we can also look for deep anterior and lateral T wave inversions. This is a sign of strain. It's not normal to have huge QRS complexes and T wave inversions. That's no longer a dominant juvenile T wave pattern. This is something extra, LVH. Finally, the coup de grace, dagger-like Q waves in the inferior and lateral leads, a residue of exaggerated repolarization of that honking big septum. On echo, you can correlate all of this with maybe asymmetric septal hypertrophy or systolic anterior movement of the mitral valve and early aortic valve closure. Well, what do we do about a child who may have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Remember, we need that echo, which often means admission or observation. A stepwise approach to the treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the current thinking. Usually, they'll start with medical management with beta blockers. The idea is to slow the heart somewhat, let it fill properly so that it can stent open that left ventricular outflow tract. Failing medical treatment, there are invasive and also minimally invasive ways to ablate the septal tissue or perform a myomectomy. 
Some very symptomatic patients with dysrhythmias may also need an AICD. Okay, we've mastered two potential killers on the EKG, WPW and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. WPW. Orthodromic, narrow complex tachycardia, looks like and acts like SVT until, uh-oh, hot dog, you see the pre-excitation on the post-treatment EKG and you get that kid a cardiologist. Antidromic, wide complex tachycardia, Treat it like VTAC if you have to with synchronized cardioversion, but procainamide works for both orthodromic and antidromic conductions. If you see an irregular, wide complex tachycardia, danger, danger, do not give AV nodal agents to a wide complex tachycardia. Only procainamide or electricity. In short, WPW, procainamide, electricity. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, syncope on exertion, dagger-like Q waves laterally and inferiorly. Get that kid an echo. On part two of EKG killers, we'll talk about QT abnormalities, Brugada syndrome, and ARVD. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.